Hi, welcome to the Morton Brown Weekly Market Update. It is the week of February 15th, President's Day week, and I'm here with Dennis Morton and Cody Demmel. Hello, gentlemen. How are you doing? Great. So a few things we want to cover in this week's market update. One, what are the questions that business owners maybe don't want to answer? We'll dive into that a little bit. And then touch on bond yields. We've talked a little bit about the fixed income market in previous episodes, but we continue to have some interesting movements and a lot of issuance that we want to dive into. And then finally, thinking about the stock market as a pendulum and what that may mean for investors. So why don't you kick us off? We discussed an article in the New York Times about questions business owners may not want to answer. What, what are some of those questions? Right. It's all about succession planning. There's a story in the Times about a small canning company where the founder unexpectedly passed away and did not have a succession plan in place. The story ends well for him. His son stepped in, started running the business, but the disruption that happened in the family was the real story. And they, they gave multiple examples of how just that general lack of preparation and, and business owners having it all in their heads and not thinking about succession and what if something happens to me and it just threw everything into chaos for them. We work with business owners and through their succession plans and, and often how they transition to the next generation and, and successfully retire. But this isn't just a business succession issue. This is almost every family wealth story too. Did you guys pick up on that as well? Yes. Yeah. We often talk about that. We see that with a lot of the families that, that we work with or that maybe initially come to us. One, one spouse runs the finances and the investments, which is okay. I mean, there has to be some divide, but you need that communication there. And, and the challenge comes when everything to your point is maybe in, in one spouse's head, but that's not always great for the other spouse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, in this case of the canning company, it was ready to be sold and the sale was set to go through and the owner died two weeks before the transaction. And, and it's just this, this idea that they were trying to stick the landing. I mean, this, this was like a high wire act and all, everything had to go perfectly. And it's, just, it's, it's heartbreaking because that's not how it has to be. It doesn't have to be priced to perfection. Uh, the, the quote from the son, he said, my dad hadn't been willing to let go. Like if only he would have let go of that control, things would have been more sustainable, but that's, that, that, that runs against our, our nature sometimes. What, what did you observe in that, in that article, Cody? Yeah, I think that's kind of the main thing that I got out of it is as humans, I think sometimes we have a hard time wanting to change something when it's going so well. Whether it's even just getting out or just changing something in general. Obviously, the stock market's been doing great over the past 10 years. So sometimes right. people have a tough time getting a little more conservative, but it's really important to protect them on the downside. So, Right. And I think it's the, the article made a good point to talk about this. Succession can be scary because it's talking about handing off to someone else or letting someone else in. Let's think instead about continuity. How do we make sure that this keeps going? Because in, in the worst case, some of these other businesses, they don't succeed. They fail and, and or, or family financial plans fail. We Unfortunately, we've, we've seen that too, where things um, are left to one spouse and, and it's not a healthy situation. So think in terms of continuity, and that might be a healthier way than the aversion to succession. So. Yes, that's a really good point. So movements and bond yields. Cody. Um, so there was a couple of articles we were looking at. One was talking about the junk bonds, so some of the really risky bonds and just the movement that we've seen in their yields. And then also the rise that we've seen in the 10-year treasury yield has been a welcome change recently too. You know, when we talk about yields on treasuries, this is how much you can earn on safe money. And the 10-year treasury is a good benchmark for that. So it had gotten down as low as 0.6, 0.7% last year. And we were kind of back up into the 1.2% range recently, which is a, which is a pretty substantial move. So when we think about bond investing, it's always a matter of you should get paid for the amount of risk that you take. If you're not taking a risk and you're investing in something safe, your income is going to be lower. But recently, we've seen really low quality companies, like barely above bankruptcy, issuing debt that's paying 3 or 4%. 3 or 4% was what you were getting on a treasury a couple of years ago. So there's really not a lot to be, to be made. How, what, what did you see, Katie, on the, on the bond side? Yes. So, well, back to your point of the, the issuance. So there's been $139 billion of 
in below investment grade bonds issued here recently. This was um, an article in the Wall Street Journal. 13 billion of that were at the triple C, which is like just above the default. And those bonds are, you know, they're borrowing that money for less than 4%. Those companies, so those super risky companies are borrowing the money at the lowest rates ever. And so as an investor on the other side to recognize how on the fringe those bonds are. And, and when we think about, all right, if you're, if you're boosting yield or you need yield, you need that income. You know, we've talked about this before, and I understand how some of those risk adverse investors kind of creep more into stock because mm-hmm. at that point you may be taking less risk on the stock side of the equation than the bond side of the equation. So it's really important to know those, those ratings are important. So we asked, them, why can this happen? Like, why can really low quality companies issue this much debt? It's because there's demand for it. Like people are desperate to find any place to get returns. So to bring this back to the stock market conversation, how does that impact stock investors? Is that when interest rates are low and you need returns, there are a lot of people that go into stocks that really don't want to be there. They're going there because they have to, because they can't earn enough on their safe money on treasuries or other bond instruments. So if interest rates start to go up, you might see people leave the stock market to go back in because they say, oh, you know what, I can get one and a quarter, one and a half percent. That's good enough. And I don't need to take the risk of the stock market. So rising interest rates can create volatility because it gives you an option that, that you didn't have before when rates were at 0.6 or 0.7. All right. So, so bring that over, sticking with the stock market for a minute. How is that like a pendulum? Oh. That's an interesting analogy. Uh, so, the, so the one article was comparing the, the stock market to a pendulum, um, and it was saying when, when we're closer to the three o'clock, the stock should be undervalued, the odds of future returns are higher, but that investors aren't really wanting to go into stock market at that point. I think that's kind of what we saw at the, in March of last year when we had the sell-off. People were scared of the, the stock market. They wanted to get out. But then when you get closer to nine, 10 o'clock, so overvalued, the odds of higher returns are, are lower. I mean, for a recent example, like GameStop, people are piling in. So it's just interesting what we've seen over the past year. And I love the idea that, and and we've talked about this a lot, nothing ever stops at six o'clock. Like if you're going from three to six, and and sometimes, you know, if you imagine a pendulum, it sometimes can pause at the extremes, but it never stops in the middle. But we spend a lot of energy trying to rationalize why we're at six when we're actually closer to three or closer to nine. And six being the optimum time to invest or, or the, the, the most the most comfortable spot as an investor, I should say. Not yeah. the only time to invest, but the most comfortable spot as an investor when things are going well. Right, right. And it's also this idea of you're never all in and you're never all out. If you try and just be one or the other, you're gonna end up missing the momentum that, that swings in the other direction. So it's it's a it's a process. And I love the pendulum thing is also important because it's never static. There's always movement. Right. And, and you're never you're never paused, and that's why that's why good investing is, is a process and it's not, you know, a, a guarantee or a one-stop solution. Right. All right. So coming off of the long weekend here and, you know, we're, we're still in some respects, oh, a little bit of a shutdown. There aren't as many out external activities going on. So I imagine there's been some, some movies playing in, in your households. Uh, Cody, why don't, why don't you share with us some of your, your favorites that, that you tend to gravitate towards? I honestly don't know if I have a lot of favorite movies. I'm more of a live sports guy than movies. Courtney, my fiance, I'm sure, which wishes that was not the case, but it is. <laughs> Have you ever watch reruns of sports? Like my husband will pull up clips from basketball games from like the eighties and nineties and be like, Oh, remember this play? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I did not watch re- reruns. I mean, like a highlight every once in a while, but not, a rerun of a whole game where a majority of it. All right. All right. Dennis, how about you? What's, what's been on your television lately? I am a sucker for anything that, that uh, is like masterpiece theater, like British television. If it's, in, if it's in a British accent and set in the early 20th century or Victorian era, you know, I'm in. So it's just, <laughs> I've, I think, I think I've binged all of masterpiece theater from the last 20 years you know, recently. So it's great, great stuff. Oh, that's funny. How about you? What do you what do you watch? What's your what's your guilty pleasure? You know, I I'm a big Adam Sandler fan. I am. I mean, I, I could watch Wedding Singer on rerun probably. And and the funny thing is that 
my son starting to like some Adam Sandler, but navigating what's appropriate or not appropriate for him to watch is is the challenging thing. But as, <laughs> as, as, Cody, as Cody pointed out uh, the other day, we're coming up with a 25 year anniversary of Happy Gilmore. So as we're heading into golfing season and the Masters coming up, that'd be, a, you know, Judah McGavin and uh, <laughs> Bob Barker. So that, there's, that, that might be worth some revisiting. Excellent. Good stuff. Well, thanks for tuning in today to our weekly market update. And if you have any questions or any topics you'd like us to cover, please feel free to reach out. We would love to hear from you. In the meantime, we hope you have a great week and we'll look forward to catching up next week.